Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. What Mr. Peter did not become news for the residents of the village, because in recent years, everyone marveled at how, despite all his ailments and age, well into his 90s, Peter continued to roam the earth. But no one rejoiced at Peter's demise. And, in general, there were no indifferent people, because Peter was known as an eccentric old man, but with a kind heart, a sense of humor, and great life wisdom. He appeared in the village in the early 90s, and after buying a house that stood on the outskirts, essentially even at some distance from the village, he announced to everyone that he would be farming. However, people dismissed it with a wave of their hand. What kind of farming is this? Who do you intend to sell this potatoes and other garden gifts to? But Peter was a clever man in addition to his eccentricity, and soon, having built greenhouses and hotbeds with his own hands, he started managing and things went uphill for him. It turned out that despite the difficult and ambiguous times, there were buyers in the city, where Peter went with his goods. It might seem like who would be surprised by garden strawberries, but Peter offered white and yellow strawberries, as well as some strange berries clearly of overseas origin. And it turned out that newly rich people were more than willing to buy such things. In general, Peter didn't elaborate much on his business, but in the village, it's hard to keep anything hidden from the community. And he was seen at the city market. People shook their heads. Clever Peter turned out to be lucky. But what about berries in winter? But it turned out that by winter, Peter had managed to build an extension to his house, something like an additional kitchen, and he even built a smokehouse with his own hands and started cooking fish there. He bought catches from local guys and smoked them according to special recipes to make delicacies, again for sale in the city. And in spring, Peter bought land from the former collective farm and planted it with carrots, beets, and some other vegetables. He found buyers in the city. He began to grow more berries scientifically, not only by his own efforts. He built greenhouses, hired workers, and became a real farmer. Locals initially looked askance at him, simply because of the social difference, saying, well, the smartest one has emerged from somewhere. But then Peter gained universal respect. Firstly, he helped the villagers. It was easy to borrow money from him when times were tough. However, Peter seemed to have x-ray vision, and he never gave money to anyone who wanted it for a bottle. Secondly, he assisted the local school with repairs. He also cleared the local pond, which transformed from a puddle into a small, charming lake where people could have picnics and sunbathe. No one knew exactly how much Peter had from his farming, but it was suspected to be substantial. However, no one could understand what he actually spent the money on. Initially, he spent quite generously, and it was clear on what. He restored a two-story house that was built in the mid-last century, so that it civilized, so to speak, people from the city could come here for recreation. But from the mid-80s, the house stood abandoned, and by the 90s, it was in a sad state. Peter took care to restore its decent appearance, but people could only see what he did on the outside, as Peter did not like receiving guests. Peter traveled as long as he could drive a regular car, dressed simply, and even in a way that, if one didn't know who he was, could make one think, this poor man is in trouble. It was also widely known that Peter was lonely, and there were many theories about it. Some said he grew up in an orphanage. Others insisted that it was certainly a family conflict. Perhaps some unfortunate love was involved. In short, everyone could only guess why he was a loner. And so Peter lived quietly, managed his own affairs, and then died. Doctors said that his death was easy, his heart just failed in his sleep. So what do we do now? asked Ms. Jennifer. She was Peter's closest neighbor and knew him slightly better than others because, in recent years, as a single mother with two girls aged 6 and 12, she survived by working on the hermit's farm. She would visit him two or three times a week to tidy up the house and prepare meals. Naturally, everyone was terribly curious to learn about the recluse's private life. On this subject, there was a conversation between Jennifer and a local guy named Ronald. It happened a couple of months before Peter departed to the other world. His house is ordinary. Imagine, he doesn't even have any expensive appliances. The fridge and the stove is just an ordinary one. 
In general, everything is simple. Well, what do you expect, she shrugged. Many millionaires and even billionaires live modestly. I've seen that in England, they may even take the subway and walk around in worn out socks. But then why bother earning money, asked Ronald. Maybe he spends it on charity, suggested Samantha, Jennifer's older daughter. He likes to say that goodness must always prevail. Why does he say that? Ronald didn't understand. How should I know? Samantha shrugged. Sometimes he thinks about it and mutters to himself. In short, psycho. Ronald summed it up. But it's interesting, where does he put the money? Probably saving. I heard about pathological hoarding. People in the village didn't particularly like Ronald because he was the guy who visits and always asks to be fed. He was also the guy who knows how to work but doesn't like it, lazy, though talented. And he was a joker with a penchant for daydreaming, but none of his ideas ever reached completion. They didn't like Ronald, but considered him a harmless the village character because he didn't drink in life, as he was allergic to alcohol. People also felt a little sorry for Ronald because he was raised by a bitter alcoholic father. Ronald's mother died from alcohol. She drank something of poor quality when her son was four. Then the guy was completely orphaned. His father died from the same alcohol but not directly, he just fell asleep in a snowdrift. It happened in the year when Ronald had final exams. He miraculously did not fail them. And now he intended to go to the city to study to become a sushi chef, car mechanic, or builder. Ronald himself had not yet decided. And for this vague character trait, they assigned him the position of unemployed and eventually, the village fool. But Ronald didn't take offense and skillfully defended himself by putting his interlocutor in place, citing examples of great people who achieved something only after the age of 40. Anyway, no one wanted to take Ronald seriously. Naturally, Peter's death promised to create a lot of problems. In the sense that everyone was curious and unclear about what would happen to all his property. And then suddenly it turned out that on his bed, under the pillow, the old man kept an envelope with the inscription, open in case of my death. The doctor opened this envelope. Then he looked around at the bewildered villagers who peered into the house out of neighborly curiosity, drawn by the news of an ambulance in Peter's yard. Here it is, the doctor said. Is it a will? asked Ronald. No. It's an address to all the residents of the village of the village. I haven't dealt with something like this before, the doctor waved his hand, and I've never seen it. Well, please read it. Ronald exclaimed. Me? The doctor widened his eyes. You're the only one here who seems like an official figure. Ronald scratched his head. And how did you even get here? The doctor opened and closed his mouth. I called him, you silly head. Jennifer sobbed. I came to see Peter. We agreed today that I would wash the windows and… Oh, what a disaster. I was planning to cook cabbage soup with bacon today, just how he liked it. And the woman burst into tears. Pull yourself together, please. The doctor tried to cheer her up. Are there any relatives of the deceased? No, Jennifer sniffled loudly into her handkerchief. He was alone. You see, it's in the letter, let's have you read it instead. And he handed her the letter. Jennifer took the envelope, tore it open, and pulled out a notebook sheet filled with Peter's handwriting. She began reading it aloud, slowly and clearly, so that everyone could understand. It turned out that Peter had drawn up a will, kept by a certain notary. He specified the notary's last name and address. He clarified that he wanted to transfer his property to a specific person in the village, and that. Oh. Jennifer gasped, began to sink against the wall, and only didn't fall because Ronald caught her by the arms. It says here that he's giving me the land, and equipment, and the house, everything for the farm. Oh, my. Just in time to attach yourself, someone maliciously hissed behind them, but Jennifer didn't notice. Quite a crowd had gathered at the neighbors because not many deaths happened in the village, not because they were rare but because these sad events occurred at a rate typical for villages and towns. The thing was that Peter was quite a personality, attracting attention to himself. 
An envious remark came from Miranda. This 45-year-old woman had a less than stellar reputation in the village because she drank so much that she couldn't see straight. She also brought men into her life, so to speak, looking for a husband and changing them too often, which would be considered improper even for the most desperate lonely woman. Miranda hadn't worked anywhere for a long time. She was fed and mostly kept drunk by her partners. At the moment, her partner was Michael, a former lumber mill worker fired for absenteeism and attempted theft. These characters were so disliked in the village that they weren't even allowed to buy anything on credit at the store. For their alcohol and snacks, they had to go to the neighboring village. The saleswoman told them. When you come back for normal products instead of that damn booze, I'll start serving you. What do you want here? Someone from the neighbors pushed Miranda away from the crowd of villagers. Go away, Peter wouldn't want to see you at his funeral. You're disgracing all of the village. Well, since you're the heir, the doctor sighed, take care of the funeral. Of course. Jennifer nodded. We'll do everything as it should be. Poor Peter, all alone, and how, why, what for, why me, the shocked woman repeated. I never thought about it, just helped. So, citizens, the doctor shook his head, those who have nothing to do with all this, you better not crowd around. Now we need to carry and transport, you understand. When Peter was on the village cemetery, the residents covered his resting place with flowers. Almost everyone came, except those considered heartless, like Miranda. On the day they said, goodbye, to Peter, the weather was so nice that one could think late autumn had decided to turn back, giving way to summer. The sun warmed, and the wind rustled gently in the treetops. At the impromptu farewell ceremony in the cemetery, everyone had something good to say about Peter. They remembered his eccentricity. Remember what he did about 10 years ago? Kevin addressed those who came to the memorial service. Kevin was one of the village laborers who had been feeding himself from working for Peter all these years. Kevin valued his boss because Peter paid his workers generously, so generously that you could feed the whole family and still have something left. In general, as Kevin thought, it was not surprising that the old man hadn't accumulated wealth because he paid such high salaries. And if someone had a reason, for example, if someone went on sick leave, he always supported them financially, and no one saw it as charity. No. They knew that the farmer did it from the bottom of his heart. Just helping out if someone had a problem. I remember. Ronald raised his hand, as if he were still a schoolboy, we used to go to the river, listen to the tales of my grandmother back then when she was still alive. In general, we heard stories about the cursed mill and mermaids. They said the mill was cursed in ancient times, and mermaids appeared there. They would come out and catch people at night. Oh, we were scared to death. I wasn't interested in fairy tales back then. Kevin grinned. I had already settled down here. I remember my neighbor knocked on my window, her name was Miss Kate, remember? Well, she went to the city, became a teacher. Everyone around nodded, and Kevin continued. I remember she knocked on my window and said that her daughter, Lisa, was nine years old then. She had run off to that pond. I was afraid she might drown too, but when Peter appeared. Many villagers remembered this story. The kids had set up a bonfire on the shore and started scaring each other with tales of the supernatural. Then someone suggested summoning the water spirit. In the end, they gathered on the bank, calling, throwing caramels with iris into the water to lure the supernatural beings. Suddenly, the bushes rustled, and the children ran scattering, thinking that mermaids had come. But it was Peter. He chased the kids from the river, waving bundles of nettles, chased them all the way to the village, and the young seekers of mermaids ran to their own yards. After that, no one scolded Peter for the performance because it even turned out to be beneficial, and the kids became more obedient, at least for a while. Not forever, of course. It's typical for all children to quickly forget. Yes, the old man had his quirks. Kevin sighed. But he was a good man, let's remember him. The next day, Jennifer went to Peter's house. She needed to clean up, sort things out. Then, during the week, she planned to go to the notary to start the inheritance proceedings as required. 
She still couldn't believe that she had suddenly become rich, and she was a little scared. Jennifer had never been involved in any business and didn't know how to approach farming. Therefore, although she knew that it would take another six months before she could dispose of everything, she was already thinking that maybe she should sell it all to some real businessman. Then she could put the money earned into the bank and slowly raise her daughters, making sure that Alana and Samantha had a good start in life. To speed things up, Jennifer asked for Ronald's help. She also called Kevin, who willingly agreed. Lately, Kevin tried not to be at home at all, and it was because of his wife. He married out of great love, but then it turned out that they were completely unsuitable for each other. He would have divorced a long time ago if it weren't for the birth of his son, George. Now it was impossible to even think about it. Therefore, Kevin made a conscious effort to pretend that everything was normal in his family, but sometimes it didn't work. Mama, I won't do anything, the eldest daughter stubbornly declared, puffing her cheeks and crossing her arms over her chest when Jennifer said that she would also participate in sorting out Peter's house. And you have no right to make me do it. Oh, look at this, Jennifer said. Well, if that's the case, go home. Wait, she added with a sly tone before her daughter could happily run away. Study your lessons, wash the dishes, and sweep the floor. By the way, we also need to peel potatoes for dinner. Oh, mom. Samantha rolled her eyes. Don't a mom me here, her mother warned, wagging her finger. I won't allow you to be lazy. Look at what nonsense you've come up with, lazy bones. Generally, when Jennifer worked at Peter's house, she usually left her daughters at home, but sometimes she took them with her. They would sit quietly in some corner, the elder with her smartphone, the younger with a book, while Jennifer took care of the household. Mom, can I help too? Alana jumped around like a playful kid. This little one was always eager to help, and Jennifer encouraged her enthusiasm, hoping that Alana would grow up to be a good housekeeper. Of course, my sunshine. My bright star, she said, patting her daughter on the head. See that shelf? Take the books one by one and stack them into two piles, understood? The daughter nodded. In one pile, put the children's books with pictures, and in the other, put all the rest. We'll take them to our village library later. Peter would have liked that his things continue to serve people. And when are we going to sort out Witch's Hut? Can I help there too? Alana asked. Sweetie, Jennifer sighed, waving her hands. I don't understand where you got that from. What are you talking about? Where do you even see Witch's Hut? There. The child pointed with her hand to one of the walls of the house, but there was no door there, just a wall. Next to the wall was a huge antique chest. You're confusing something, my little star, Jennifer said affectionately, but she felt a shiver down her spine. Because once, while working in the yard, she needed to weed a small flower bed and take care of the plants. Later, Jennifer remembered that she forgot to ask Peter about the fertilizers he used for the flowers. She returned to the house, entered this room, and found Peter moving the chest for some reason. The old man suddenly turned around, and his eyes were, for some reason, he looked angrily, wildly, frighteningly. But it lasted just a moment, and then he became as friendly and kind as always. Jennifer thought that maybe she imagined it all. Well, people move chests for various reasons, and the look? Perhaps he got scared because she approached unnoticed. And now her daughter was talking about another room behind the wall. But there should be a door. Where is it? Where is it hidden? Jennifer didn't like the direction of these thoughts. It's there, Alana stubbornly exclaimed. Remember when you were frying cabbage and onion pies for grandpa? You told me not to disturb you, and I left. Jennifer vaguely remembered something. I thought you were playing in the yard. I walked around the house first, the girl replied. I came here, and there was a little open door. The door is small, like it's made for a little child. I peeked inside, and there was something scary, visible and invisible at the same time. Alana waved her hands. Kevin, who had been carefully wrapping dishes with newspapers and placing them in boxes, stopped what he was doing. Ronald, coughing from the dust, also turned his attention to the conversation. 
Jennifer felt a chilling sensation crawling down her spine. What's so scary, sweetie? Knives, Alana replied. Pictures, the queen in the pictures, old books. Daughter, what are you talking about? What knives? Jennifer, whose lips were already trembling, grabbed Alana by the shoulders and stared into her eyes, trying to understand if the little one was just fantasizing. Dry grass, a cauldron like witches. Mama, I'm not lying, I swear. And what happened next? Was Grandpa Peter there? Yeah, the little one nodded. He saw me, took me out of there, and told me not to tell anyone about it. That's all. Then we went to eat pies. Alana smiled and swung her legs as if nothing had happened. Ugh, was all Ronald could say. What is this? Let's check it out. With these words, he rushed towards the same chest. Heavy, damn it. Kevin, help. The men strained, and the chest, with an unpleasant screech of legs on the floor, moved aside. And behind it appeared a door, not very tall, indeed a small child could pass through it, and an adult would have to bend down. There was a lock on the door. The key is probably somewhere among his things, Kevin said. We need to find it. Why? We can just open it boldly, as if we've been waiting for this gloomy adventure, said Ronald. And after a couple of minutes, returning with tools for fixing everything, all that Peter needed was kept in a drawer in the hallway, Ronald picked the lock. We need a flashlight, he added, hesitating. It's on the phone, Kevin replied. And maybe we shouldn't? Jennifer squeaked. Why? The old man left you everything, the house too. So, everything inside it too. Even your child has been there, Ronald said, and decisively pushed the door open. Darling, sit here, mom will come soon, Jennifer told her daughter, and Alana listened, but pouted, just like her older sister. The little room behind the wall was very narrow. Both walls could be touched by spreading arms. But it was quite long, as it stretched along the entire side wall of the house. Jennifer fearfully peeked over the shoulders of the men. This was the last thing she needed for Grandpa Peter to turn out to be some kind of maniac. She had heard about such cases, when a seemingly ordinary person, who could even be a model family man, suddenly turned out to be so airy that it made your hair stand on end. So, had she been helping around the house and cooking for a crazy person all this time? What horror! And she often brought her daughters with her. No, Jennifer couldn't blame herself now. Even when she worked part-time in the store, she often brought the girls with her, leaving the younger one under the care of the older one. And what's wrong with children being with their mother all day? It made her feel calmer. It was more fun for Alana, and Jennifer could make sure that the older one wasn't doing anything foolish, for example, not playing on the phone but at least sometimes reading a book. Wow, exclaimed Kevin, who was in the lead. This, damn it, is something. What a guy Peter was. It's like a museum here. What? What's there? Jennifer asked anxiously, unable to make out anything in the swinging light of the flashlight, and something scary seemed to be playing tricks on her imagination. Wait, there's a light switch here, Ronald suddenly said and clicked it. The secret place, where Peter didn't allow a living soul, was flooded with warm yellow light. In it, everything became clearly visible. Jennifer, however, didn't feel good at all. On the walls, portraits of some people, clearly residents of bygone eras, coexisted with colorful dark posters of horror movies, where monsters with fangs, easily recognizable as vampires of all kinds, attacked people or just grinned at the audience. On rare shelves stood some bottles of colored glass and clay pots, and the books, fold, it seemed scary to touch them, were scattered on several tables, and even on a chair. But most of all, the visitors had unanswered questions about the weapons, ancient sabers and daggers, as well as a crossbow hanging from the ceiling. There were also some huge sheets of drawing paper, marked with whimsical symbols. From the ceiling, besides the crossbow, hung bundles of herbs, and for some reason, old coins were suspended on red threads. What is this? Were you like this, Peter? Kevin said with a nervous chuckle. It seems, Ronald said, leaning somehow to the side, our grandpa was a vampire hunter. 
A hunter? Jennifer shook her head, not knowing what to do, whether to just cry or hysterically laugh. Yeah, continued Ronald, and a little higher for everyone to see, he lifted his find, a sharply sharpened wooden stake. A vampire hunter, he said, kicking the remaining stakes on the floor. They didn't stay in this strange room for long. They almost ran out without talking, but quickly in together without saying a word. The atmosphere there was too heavy. Naturally, there could be no talk of any further ordinary cleaning and sorting of things in the deceased's house. Mom, I'm mad at you, Alana pouted. Why didn't you take me with you? I'll buy you chocolate and a doll with braids, the one that's a princess frog. Do you want that? Jennifer suddenly spoke tenderly to her daughter. Sunshine, just about what you saw here, about us going through the door, don't tell anyone, okay? Let it be our secret. Well, the girl thought and replied, and also a big box of jelly candies. Agreed, Jennifer said, patting the little one on the head. That evening, they gathered for a council at Jennifer's house. So, we need to decide what to do with all this, she said. On the table stood a teapot, and there were fried pastries with meat in a dish. Well, the man had a quirk, said Kevin. Peter was a good guy, worldly, never harmed anyone, only did good. That's true, sighed Jennifer. She turned her head and looked at the door. I just put the girls to bed in the next room. But what now? Why did he collect all this? What kind of horror was he gathering? Some abnormal collection. That's what I think, Kevin suggested thoughtfully, we need to involve some specialists. Maybe museum employees? They'll tell us the value of all this. Don't look at me like that, Jennifer. We need to figure this out, or do you want to leave everything as it is? Well, that's an idea, said Ronald in his characteristic playful manner. You know, nowadays it's trendy to celebrate Halloween. City folks might come, and you could charge them a fee for a tour of this horror room. Oh, come on, you're talking nonsense about fears for the night, the homeowner waved him off. I'm thinking that Peter had some unhealthy interest. Who in our time believes in vampires? But he couldn't be, she lowered her voice, as if someone might overhear them and inadvertently witness her offending the deceased with her suspicions. He couldn't be a maniac, right? When could he find time for that? He was either working or sitting at home. Well, he occasionally went to the city, but my wife loves crime news, and she watches TV loudly, so whether I liked it or not, I would hear about someone being found with a stake in their heart. In general, I haven't heard of such cases. Oh, my head hurts already. Jennifer poured herself some hot tea but didn't touch the drink. She sat there gloomy. If we had known earlier, maybe we could have helped Pete. With what? Ronald sarcastically asked. Did you advise him to buy garlic for planting? Found time for jokes, Kevin chided him. A sense of humor can be a savior in dangerous situations, Ronald winked. Personally, now I'll have something to tell. Not right now, of course, but someday I'll be able to tell the story of how I visited the lair of the neighbor's psychopath and came back alive. And you know, it seems to me. Just a moment, Ronald jumped up from the table and ran to the corridor, where, coming to Jennifer's house, he had put some bag on the floor, by the way. Jennifer thought he probably just stopped by from work. Ronald worked as a programmer now and was setting up the internet throughout the village. Here, the guy placed two things on the table, a large and thick notebook in a plastic cover and a small painting. Did you take something from there? Jennifer said in shock. And what? It's not a pyramid, so that a curse for looting would catch up with me, Ronald grinned. At least, I really hope not. While you were rustling there in the hallway, I... What did you say? That you dropped the keys from the house there, Kevin said reproachfully, interrupting him. But you would start grumbling. I saw the faces you made when you came out of there. And I immediately noticed that this notebook was lying separately in the corner and thought it might be something important. In short, I took a look, and it's a diary. Peter wrote it, and it seems to explain everything. Well, almost everything. Ronald opened the notebook. So read it, Kevin urged him, and the guy began to read aloud. 
It turned out that Peter was not as simple as he seemed. He had a higher education and was a candidate of sciences. His specialization was the culture of Eastern Europe in the 14-15th centuries. Peter mentioned that his research could have been more complete if his friend, also a scientist, had taken it seriously. But the friend only laughed at him. Some pages in the diary were missing, and one could only guess why this had happened. Therefore, at times, it seemed that there were significant gaps between Peter's narrative. Yet, the essence was clear, as clear as the essence of something that resembled madness could be. It turned out that Peter decided to study cultural history not just casually but under the influence of his own grandfather, who was also a scientist. Grandpa said that they must, absolutely must understand why a curse hangs over their family and how to lift it. The essence of this curse manifested itself in the fact that all the men in the family had unhappy marriages. And if it were only about divorces. Wives went crazy, misfortunes happened to them on the wedding anniversary. Some left their husbands with babies in their arms, others pushed their spouses into gambling and other vices, while they themselves disappeared somewhere on the horizon with their lovers. Peter's grandfather believed that all this happened because, at the end of the 18th century, one of their ancestors enriched himself through evil means, thus gaining powerful enemies who cursed him. And they were not just unusual people, and not just some wizards, but vampires. Therefore, Peter's grandfather taught him from a young age the secret science of how to recognize a vampire. You know, if my grandpa had locked me up in a forest dugout when I was so young and scared of the dark, I would have grown up crazy too," Kevin interrupted the reading. Well, it's just bad luck with women, that's all. Maybe there were happy marriages. It's just that this crazy old man didn't want to mention them to avoid spoiling his statistics," Ronald agreed. Why? Well, this is some kind of nonsense," Kevin nodded. I agree, Ronald concurred. I thought, if you look at books and movies, vampires attack for feeding, but here it turns out these are not just vampires, but also dark sorcerers. You have to have a rich imagination for this. And what a callous heart one must have, Ronald chuckled, to drag your own grandson into the forest and scare him with your tails. No wonder Peter's attic was leaking in some places. Agreed, Jennifer took a sip of cold tea, grimaced, and turned on the kettle for boiling water. I don't understand how he could get a higher education, work somewhere, even go on a business trip to Europe. It turns out he left his family, freed himself from its influence, and then his mind broke from everything he experienced, from all these things that were hammered into his head. So, he was a normal person, and then he completely lost his mind. There are such cases, Kevin said, rare, but they happen. Maybe it's hereditary for them. Who knows? How awful, Jennifer shuddered. Here lived a man, a good guy, okay, even if only we knew. By the way, not a word from you, understand, she wagged her finger. Peter did a lot of good for the village, and he doesn't deserve to be treated as a joke after death. Not a word, Ronald said. I agree, affirmed Kevin. What else does it say? Wait, give it to me. Your voice is already hoarse. Let's continue then. Peter wrote about how, at a certain point, his career in Europe didn't go well. To be more precise, his colleagues, seeing his strong interest in vampire legends, began teasing him. And when he started getting too involved in the topic, neglecting everything else, he was disgracefully and mockingly expelled. But he wasn't upset because he knew he had done enough to trace those creatures that had once ruined his family's life. Ruined his family's life, Ronald mimicked from the diary. Interestingly, so the ancestors turned out to be thieves, vampires, sorcerers. So they were cursed for their deeds? But not a word about that. Peter pretends in his record that his family are innocent victims. Cleverly done. Wait, we'll have time to give our opinion, Kevin raised his finger. Here, it gets even more interesting. In just two lines, Mr. Peter mentioned that, as a student, he met the love of his life, the beautiful Sarah, but she preferred someone else, and naturally, the curse was to blame. Dryly and briefly, Peter mentioned that business in the early 90s came to him easier than he expected. And, in principle, he already understood that the business of his whole life would not be finished because his searches were broken, ended in nothing, 
as the rich family in which some people were impure perished at the end of the 19th century, and their children left no descendants. In general, it seemed that everything was over. But despite this, in the late 90s, Peter found people who valued antiquity and bought from them items that were used in the past by real vampire hunters. He thought that, just in case, he should be ready to destroy the creatures of the night. Did such beings exist, gasped Jennifer. Whom were they hunting? I suppose they just extorted money from honest citizens, said Ronald. And who would ask them for evidence? They could lie, saying that the vampire turned to dust after the stake, and that's it. The wind carried away the dust. Or maybe some homeless person got into their hands. Well, I won't touch those daggers and sabers with my bare hands, Jennifer said with a sense of horror. What a horror. You still don't know what's coming next, Kevin said grimly, looking at the very end of the diary. And he read. It turned out that Peter tested all the neighbors in the village to see if any of them happened to be vampires. Earlier in the diary, he wrote that vampires shouldn't walk in the sun. But he added that since all living things in nature evolve, theoretically vampires, though undead, could also evolve, so one should not relax. Therefore, he kept an eye on the villagers but didn't suspect anyone in the end. It turned out that Peter found no specific signs of vampires in anyone, such as moles in the corner of the eye or webbed fingers. However, he added that, apart from such defects, a true vampire should not cast a shadow at sunset. In general, the neighbors were beyond suspicion. Well, that's nice, Ronald chuckled. Just imagine waking up, and Peter is standing over you with a crossbow or a silver blade. What a comedy. Exactly, a comedy to death, Kevin kicked the guy under the table, as if to say it's not the time for jokes. And your jokes, buddy, are SOSO. And what about the painting, asked Jennifer. Judging by the artist's signature, it was painted in the late 19th century. Ronald turned it. It was a portrait. It depicted a charming young girl with hair as black as a crow's wing. She was dressed and styled in a fashion reminiscent of antiquity, making her appear delicate and ethereal. Judging by the diary entries, Kevin sighed, she was the girl from the family that had vampires. She died of smallpox at the age of 18, as they wrote back then. But Peter believed she was one of the last vampires in the family, and she simply ran away to avoid the hunters. Beautiful, Kevin added. Ah, uh. why are girls like her rare nowadays? There are all kinds of girls now, Jennifer said with regret. It's just that you got involved. Is your lady causing too much trouble? Yeah, Kevin used to be shy about talking about his family problems, after all, he was a man. But then the cup of patience and willingness to endure everything silently overflowed. Originally, Kevin was not a villager. He was born in a city, a big and, as he considered in his youth, the most beautiful in the world. He couldn't remember or know his mother, she died during his birth. So, the upbringing of little Kevin fell entirely on the shoulders of the remaining two of his closest people, his father and grandmother. And as far back as Kevin could remember his childhood, his grandmother embodied for him tenderness, care, warmth, understanding, kindness, while his father, strictness, coldness, indifference, and resentments. But Kevin still loved his father. As soon as he began to understand himself, he felt that there must be something defective, something wrong, because his father didn't love him. When Kevin turned 12, his grandmother died of a stroke, leaving him and his father alone. At first, Kevin was glad that his father didn't drink. He thought that the absence of this vice would provide some guarantee that they could live normally. However, it turned out that besides alcohol, there were other vices, and Kevin's father turned out to be an unstoppable gambler. By the time Kevin turned 18, his father had managed to gamble away everything that could be taken from the apartment, and then the apartment itself. It turned out that he had somehow managed to use his share to secure it for sports betting. One day, serious, grim people came to the apartment, putting Kevin before the fact that he had to sell his tiny share to them for pennies because they would definitely not allow him to live there. For the first time in his life, Kevin raised his hand against his father, hitting him in the face. Got what you deserved, old fool, he yelled at his parent, looking him straight in the eyes. I tried to help you for so long, but now you don't have a son anymore. 
Kevin felt bitter and hurt that his father had become like this. Taking advantage of his legal age, the young man hurried to leave home. There was a place to live. He enrolled in a vocational school in the neighboring city to become an auto mechanic and managed to secure a place in the dormitory. In short, a new life began. Kevin deliberately didn't answer the phone when his father called, and then a call came from the hospital. His father, like his grandmother once, had a stroke. And just as quickly, this disease took Kevin's father to the other side. Having obtained an education by this time, Kevin returned to his hometown to settle matters with the real estate. He consulted with lawyers, but they shook their heads and honestly said that all attempts to nullify the deal made by his father were doomed to failure. So Kevin agreed to sell his share of the apartment. The money he received wouldn't be enough for housing in the city, not even for the smallest room. Understanding that this money would simply disappear into someone else's pocket if he rented a place, Kevin decided that he needed to move to the village. Only there could he buy some kind of property. Kevin bought a house from an elderly couple who were moving to the city to live with their adult children. The house was a sight for sore eyes. But Kevin, as it happened, not only knew how to work with his hands but also loved it. So, gradually, what seemed like a shack became a very decent home. In the village itself, job opportunities were scarce, but in the district center, there was plenty of work for a skilled auto mechanic. And Kevin realized, here was his chance to organize his life properly. At that time, he met Ronald, who was just a kid. Somehow, they became friends, although the people around them didn't really understand this friendship. Ronald loved to inquire about city life. By then, he was already a boundless dreamer. Kevin drew optimism from him, a light look at life, despite all the circumstances. By the age of 23, Kevin had practically no experience with the opposite sex. It just turned out that way. In technical school, he thought about studies, and in the village, initially, about work and renovating the house. Looking back later, Kevin believed that his inexperience played a cruel joke on him. He thought it was this lack of experience that made him so passionately succumb to feelings when he met Brenda. She came from a neighboring village, returning from the city where she had studied sewing. They met in the district center, just went in to grab a quick bite, and ended up sitting at the same table because there were almost no free seats. They started talking. Kevin was impressed by Brenda's story. It turned out that her family life was also challenging. Her mother spent half her life in a mental institution, unable to accept her first and only lover's departure for another woman. However, Brenda was born not from that beloved man but from a completely random person. Essentially, Brenda was raised by her maternal grandmother and grandfather, and they never hid from her how troubled her mother was. Brenda admitted that she always feared going mad, repeating her mother's fate. Kevin saw in Brenda a kindred spirit, someone with a similar fate who had also suffered from the imperfections of her family. Moreover, Brenda was lively, talkative, she was so bright, capable of laughing to tears at the simplest jokes and crying after watching a sad movie. She didn't care that he wasn't wealthy. She believed that true love was the most important, and everything else would work out, leading to family happiness. They hastily entered into marriage, as if someone threatened to take away the promised happiness. And they began to live. However, much later, looking back, Kevin realized that he had been blind, not noticing obvious warning signs that his Brenda was an unusual person. He was ready to tear his hair out, remembering how her grandmother and grandfather took him aside and politely said that he was a good guy, but their Brenda was not a match for him. At that time, Kevin decided that they thought he wasn't good enough for their granddaughter. It was only later that he realized how mistaken he was. They just wanted to warn him, to save him. Soon after the wedding, Kevin, spending whole days with Brenda, began to notice how abruptly and strongly her mood would change. They could quarrel out of nowhere. Sometimes he couldn't get a simple answer from his wife to the question, what had he done wrong again? Kevin tried to adapt to Brenda's unpredictable mood swings. He was shocked when she suddenly accused him of flirting with the male woman, who, in his opinion, was more of a grandmother age-wise. Kevin used to find stories, jokes, and anecdotes about pathologically jealous husbands amusing. Now he himself became a hostage to such a wife. The incident with the male woman didn't end there. 
Brenda hit Kevin in the face, then cried and apologized, saying she didn't know what had come over her. Looking back again and again, Kevin understood that he should have divorced back then. He should have realized who was hiding behind the mask of the cute, emotionally vibrant girl. But then Brenda announced that she was pregnant. Now divorce was out of the question. Kevin attributed all her escalating whims, nitpicking, and scandals to the hormonal changes during pregnancy. He considered her strange behavior after the birth of George as postpartum depression. Kevin learned to predict Brenda's mood swings, to speak with her carefully, not to anger, not to irritate, not to provoke scandals. He understood that all of this was abnormal in some way, but he couldn't fathom what to do about it. Kevin sometimes felt horrified, how he, apparently, got used to it, how he apparently lost his pride and desire for a normal life during the time he spent as Brenda's husband. It was particularly strange that Brenda rarely lost control in public. She was generally silent and timid, speaking politely to others. However, Kevin, having studied her thoroughly over the years, could already sense when, for example, seemingly ordinary words contain a harsh, cruel subtext that others simply didn't notice. Kevin feared that over time, his son would acquire the same peculiarities as his mother. However, George was growing up completely different from her. He was kind, cheerful, sincere, easily made friends, and as George grew older, it became clear that he got along much better with his father than with his mother, whom the boy generally avoided. After the birth of their son, Kevin resigned himself to the fact that his personal life had failed. But then, when his wife threw a pot of just boiled potatoes at him, Kevin suddenly stopped holding back. He went to Jennifer for burn ointment and broke down, telling her that he endured the marriage only for the sake of their son but that he would divorce when the boy grew up. Jennifer was a bit shocked by this admission, but then she said that she had a feeling something was amiss in Kevin's family. She supported him in considering divorce as the only option. Jennifer was well aware of such situations, having gone through two painful breakups with Samantha's and Alana's fathers herself. The first man claimed to love her, wanted a family, but changed his mind as soon as he learned about Jennifer's pregnancy. He simply ran away, saying that there was no point in seeking child support because he would work under the table to avoid it. Jennifer decided that she wouldn't take a penny from a traitor. She held on for a long time but then thought that the world was a complex place, and maybe, just maybe, she could get a second chance at feminine happiness. The second man she ended up with seemed even more serious than the first. But he also betrayed her. The issue was that upon learning they were having a girl, he insisted on an abortion, claiming that he needed a son, an heir to his genes, not a useless girl. After that, Jennifer firmly decided, no more men. She preferred a peaceful female kingdom. As for her personal life, she thought she could find happiness without it. The main thing was for her daughters to be healthy, happy, well-fed, and content. Sorry, but Brenda, well, maybe it's not just her character. You mentioned her mother was crazy. Maybe, don't take offense, Jennifer added hastily, but perhaps she should see a psychologist? Yeah, I've thought about that, sighed Kevin. I don't know, I suggested a psychologist. Now there's family therapy for troubled couples, but she won't go. When I brought it up, she thought I wanted to send her to a mental hospital, can you imagine? How do you keep holding on? Jennifer shook her head. You're carrying the family alone. That's how it was. After their son was born, Brenda quit her job as a seamstress. At first, it was natural, maternity leave. Then she started saying that the noise of sewing machines gave her a headache, and she was content being a housewife. Kevin, seeing how her mood could deteriorate if she stayed among people for too long, agreed. He just wanted a somewhat peaceful life. Besides, he now worked at a large auto repair shop in the regional center, and his income covered everything and everyone. So it happened that Ronald knew about Kevin's family problems because he was Kevin's best friend. Despite being a prankster and a chatterbox, Ronald never revealed others' secrets. Now the entire small group found themselves united by one dark and peculiar secret, and everyone felt that its consequences could be quite serious. I have a question, what are the plans for the land, Jennifer? Kevin asked. No idea, Jennifer shrugged and sighed. 
It's autumn, and if all this happened in the summer or spring, there would be more to do, like harvesting. But now, if the land goes without proper agricultural care, nothing will happen until spring. Oh well, we can think about what to do with our findings later. So, what should we do? It seems to me that we'd be better off. I don't know, quietly clean up, remove all these treasures of Peter's, and pretend it never existed. It'll be easier for everyone, Kevin suggested. Ronald voiced the collective thought of the small group. However, they decided not to discuss anything further. It was getting late, and it seemed to everyone that there was simply no energy left to think about anything. The next day, Jennifer didn't even show up at the neighbor's house. She was busy with her own affairs. Later, she began cleaning up there little by little. She moved some of the things to her place. Ronald insisted that items from that room needed sorting too because creepy things, like a saber with an inscription on the blade or stakes made of aspen, were one thing, but paintings and ancient books with an apparent antique origin were quite another. All these things were carefully and, most importantly, quietly moved to Jennifer's house. The paintings were covered with fabric to avoid accidentally damaging the canvases. Then, a fire broke out, and Peter's house burned down. One night, Jennifer was awakened by knocking on the window and shouts from neighbors. She rushed out, and there it was, blazing so much it was scary to watch. The firefighters turned out to be quick and responsive, but the force of nature and something else had their way. Something else besides the fire. It's arson, one of the firefighters confidently stated. It looks very much like it. What? Jennifer couldn't believe her ears. Who would even think of doing that? Why? Who knows about people, the firefighter shrugged, taking off his helmet and greedily emptying a water bottle. Who knows? Did they say this was the deceased grandfather's house? There was a case once. A businessman divorced his wife, and she was left with nothing according to the prenup. Apparently, she was really hurt by it, so she set fire to the house, the one they were dealing with was a mansion, though. Anyway, things like that happen. But we have good people here, Jennifer felt offended for the residents of her native village. She understood that she couldn't vouch for everyone, but such an act seemed like sheer madness, completely inconsistent with the peaceful way of life in the village. By the morning, everyone naturally went to see what was left. Very little is left, almost nothing. Jennifer could only rejoice in the fact that she managed to move a lot to her house, and then, while walking there, coughing from the bitter dust rising with every step, suddenly, like lightning, she understood who could have done it. Miranda, come out, you scoundrel. Jennifer, brimming with righteous anger, knocked on the leaning door of the last house in the village. Why are you making noise, the disheveled, swollen owner of the house said, emerging. What do you want? Are you going to wake everyone up? Normal people are already up and working, Jennifer muttered through her teeth, and without any preamble, she pointed her index finger at Miranda's chest. Say, why did you burn Peter's house, huh? Jealous that he left everything to normal people, not to you, you rag, huh? What are you talking about? Miranda widened her eyes. I didn't burn anything. Oh, you're lying, Jennifer squinted unfriendly. Others have no reason for this, only you are capable of such a thing. Look at yourself, lost all human appearance. What are you talking about? Miranda looked very unwell, but she looked like that now, that Jennifer suddenly thought that maybe she wasn't the one to blame for the arson. After all, she didn't do such nasty things to the villagers before, even if she did drink. Maybe your men set it on fire? Jennifer brought up new accusations, but not so confidently. What men? I'm living with one now. Who do you take me for? You think if I'm not working now, if I'm drinking, then that's it, I'm a criminal? What do you know about me at all? Do you even have a conscience? Jennifer pursed her lips. Even if she was wrong, she had no intention of apologizing. Not to such a lost soul. Okay, maybe it wasn't you, she said and, turning around, walked away from Miranda's house. Two more weeks passed, and the fire gradually began to be forgotten. Life continued in the village, everyone had their own worries. But then the villagers were suddenly stirred by a new event. 
A certain man from the city came to the village. He arrived in a luxurious black jeep with tinted windows. And on the second car, some specialists probably came, as they had tools in their hands and walked around the field that used to belong to Peter, presumably sewn with beets. Then, leaving the specialists aside, this man went straight to Jennifer's house. Mom's not home, Samantha, who peeked out from the door, said. She's at the store, and I'm at home with my sister. She's sick, it seems she has the flu. The man in the business suit and polished to a shine crocodile leather shoes thanked her for the information, wished a speedy recovery, and went straight to the store. He arrived at an inopportune moment. Jennifer was currently arguing with Granny Gina. Gina was generally a quiet old lady, but sometimes, and usually right after receiving her pension, probably upset that the pension money quickly ran out of her hands, she would start looking for someone in the village to pick on, and her choice usually fell on the post office or the store. There was also, of course, the paramedic, but Gina maintained the best relations with him, probably to ensure good treatment. As for the others? Granny Gina liked to say about them that they were just service personnel, tools of capitalism. So let them blame themselves if they dare to disrespect her rights. This time, Gina's right was violated because they sold her seemingly stale smoked fish. Jennifer, by her health, was ready to swear that the fish was very fresh, but Gina refused to listen. Give me the complaint book and return the money. Where's the fish? I paid for it, the old woman raised her voice to such an extent that people who got stuck in line after her appearance winced. If the goods are of poor quality, they are supposed to be returned to the store, the saleswoman said. Why, I never, Gina snorted and began to bang her hand on the counter. Jennifer seriously wondered if the old lady's dry palm could crack the glass under such strong blows. Give me back my money. And also some condensed milk as compensation for moral damage. Two, no, for cans for me. Gina, maybe that's enough, a man from the queue spoke up. At least be ashamed in front of your neighbors. The fish here is normal, we bought it yesterday ourselves. Excuse me, are you Miss Jennifer? The new face that appeared in the store attracted attention because the man was tall, a head taller than everyone present. That's me, Jennifer said, tired from Granny Gina's pressure. What do you want? Are you from the insurance? No, the man replied. I need to talk to you. I'm working. What time do you finish? And what do you need? Speak quickly. I'm so tired of it all, Jennifer waved her hand, grabbing a bag of caramel candies from Granny Gina's hands, who had quietly muttered something to herself and managed to pull the bag towards her. You see, I came from Washington, and… And what? Jennifer was on the verge. A little more, and she was ready to drive everyone out of the store with curses and then hide under the shelves with the loaves and have a good cry. Maybe then it would ease the tension, and a second wind would come. I understand, I came from Washington, and… And what? Jennifer was on the verge. A little more, and she was ready to drive everyone out of the store with curses and then hide under the shelves with the loaves and have a good cry. Maybe then it would ease the tension, and a second wind would come. See, I don't have much time, and I need to talk to Peter's heiress. For what reason? This is a private conversation. Well, then leave the store and come back some other time. The man hesitated. Jennifer even felt sorry for him, he looked so lost. Please take this, he said, handing her a business card. Call me, please, when you're free. He left, and Jennifer sighed with relief. Finally, no more distractions from work. She had successfully repelled Granny Gina. The old lady bought condensed milk, tea, and buckwheat grumbled about the fish, and left. After her shift ended at 8 p.m., Jennifer took a business card out of her pocket, picked up her phone, and dialed the number. She didn't feel like having any conversations at all, but the appearance of a stranger was disturbing. His words about her being an heiress made her think he might be some kind of lawyer. Although, where had she seen a notary sending someone to talk to heirs about an inheritance? Alex, you visited today. Yes, let's agree on how to meet, and… What do you mean, you're still here? 
A minute later, Jennifer saw the car standing nearby. The same man got out and approached her. Did you wait for me in the car all day? Actually, it's been a couple of hours. I thought it would be easier for me to wait until your store's working day is over. I urgently need to talk to you. What's the urgency? It doesn't matter, what's the rush? Jennifer nervously adjusted a strand of hair that had come loose from the tightly bound bundle on the back of her head. Initially, she was almost peaceable, but as soon as this guy with the appearance that could be featured in TV series voiced the purpose of his visit, Jennifer flared up with indignation and gestured a folded figure in front of him. Take that, not my land. Wait. Alex hurried after the striding woman. I just wanted. Jennifer snorted in anger. She knew what he wanted. It turned out, he came to negotiate the purchase of the land that belonged to Peter, and he conveyed this in a derogatory manner, like. You don't understand anything about farming anyway. So, let's negotiate. I'm offering a good price. Jennifer was generally not a malicious or impatient person, but not in this case. Are you proposing this because I'm a woman or a villager? I'm sorry, Alex blurted out, almost colliding with her as she abruptly stopped, turning sharply toward him. So, you're saying I won't be able to handle it? She pointed her finger at his chest, somewhere in the center of his silk tie. Is it because you're urban and I'm rural, or do you think women are dumber than you? I didn't mean to say anything like that. But you did. Listen. Alex seemed to protect his personal space vigorously because he gently intercepted Jennifer's wrist and moved it away from him. It was strange, but the skin-to-skin -skin contact sent shivers down her spine. The thing is, Peter owned not only the field with greenhouses and all that for growing vegetables, he also had another piece of land. Now it's all overgrown with forest. It's a vast and problematic plot. It needs clearing. Really? I haven't heard about that, Jennifer responded thoughtfully, but with a hint of doubt. Perhaps because you simply assisted Peter but didn't manage his affairs. The city guy with an appearance found a sharp way to offend Jennifer. Now she knew exactly who he could play in a TV series, a cunning, heartless lawyer working for the mafia. Perhaps, Jennifer pursed her lips, but that doesn't mean I'm going to sell everything for a pittance. But I haven't named the price yet. You definitely undervalued it. May I ask why you have such an opinion about me? Why do you think I'm undervaluing? I don't know, honestly, Jennifer replied. I just don't like you, to be honest. That's it, I'm going home, and don't follow me, or else. We can just. No, she turned to him triumphantly, we can't and never will. Please leave me alone. Grayish blue clouds gathered in the sky, a storm was approaching. Jennifer marched toward her home, and although she saw that the city guy got into his car and drove away, the feeling of being watched didn't leave her. It seemed to her that someone's heavy, unkind gaze was fixed on her back. Shrugging nervously, Jennifer entered her house, deciding that it was just her imagination after meeting Alex. She didn't know that the unfriendly gaze really followed her from a distance, and for a few more minutes, it stared at the door of her house. She didn't know that the sense of threat wasn't just her imagination. It was as real as the distant thunderclap that echoed in the air. And this threat arose on the evening when she dared to bring paintings from Peter's secret room to her house, paintings that, as the old man knew, captured real vampires. For about a week, nothing happened in the village. Well, things happened, of course, but essentially these events belonged to ordinary, everyday life and didn't shock anyone. Jennifer went to the city to see the notary. The notary turned out to be not only a professional in his field but also a sympathetic person. When Jennifer shared her perplexity about how to manage a farm, he advised her to contact some neighboring farmers to help properly take care of the land and crops. It's not an easy thing, said the notary. Since you live in the village, you must know how much attention the land requires. My wife and I have a summer house. So, we missed a couple of months this year in the spring, had no time. Then we came, and pests had already feasted, and it turned out we should have applied nitrogen fertilizers on time, but we missed it. Well, and, he waved his hand. In general, agriculture is not easy. 
And if you decide, as you say, to sell or maybe rent it out, then come, I'll help, advise on all matters. Jennifer left the city satisfied with the solid, intelligent, and reasonably warm-hearted notary. Daughter, why are you on the phone again? Take these books and read, otherwise, you'll get bad grades in literature again, my poor girl. Jennifer grumbled at Samantha, meanwhile crafting another batch of pies. The previous batch was already blushing nicely on the skillet. Mom, why do I even need to study? We're rich, lazily replied the daughter. Look how smart you are, sighed Jennifer, rich. Not like that. When we sell everything, do you think I'll just waste time, skipping everything? No, darling. You need to save wisely, live frugally. And then, do you think rich people can be fools? But now I don't need to go to college. I can start a business right away, launch a startup. Jennifer rolled her eyes. Sometimes she didn't understand how she could have two such different daughters. One was a smart darling, and the other rebelled so much at the age of 12 that she could howl like a wolf. What kind of business can you talk about at such an age? You're just a little kid. No, you'll study, and you'll go to college when the time comes. Mom, I'll become a blogger soon. What? A blogger. I'll have millions of subscribers. Right now, because you're sitting on the bed again, munching cookies, we'll have millions of cockroaches. Come on, quickly, get out of here. Jennifer, sighing once again, continued to make and fry pies. She had already regretted being so harsh with Alex. Not that she intended to sell the land, but, confessing, she really didn't understand what to do with all this in the long run. Theoretically, she could figure it out over time and also engage in farming, but Jennifer recalled the conversation with the notary. He mentioned how much land belonged to Peter, and it turned out that there was not only a vegetable field, greenhouses, and the like, but also pieces of territory. Those, as it seemed to Jennifer, could be sold. It wasn't clear, though, what that guy intended to do. Anyway, the main thing was to sell, and with the money earned, she could do a lot. Firstly, she could build a new two-story house, with a glassed-in veranda and a large, very large greenhouse, maybe even a conservatory. Jennifer always dreamed of growing exotic flowers. She daydreamed so much that she almost burned the pies. After finishing with the cooking, Jennifer called her daughters to eat and have tea. She decided that she would definitely call Alex the next day. George loved his dad very much, and if his dad ordered him to behave well and not wander around dangerous places at night, he would certainly obey him because dad was smart, good, and such advice would sound reasonable. But it was mom who ordered him to stay at home, study, not play or wander, so George couldn't stay home on such a night because he didn't love mom as much. There was a period in his life when mom seemed to him the best, but then, when she started behaving strangely and scolding dad for no reason, when she became just like him, her own son, scolding him for anything, George suddenly realized that he wasn't needed by her. He understood, and he read in books that one should be able to forgive, understand that people can make mistakes, but there was no patience. And since George, while he understood, was too young to live as he wanted, at least at a young age, he could oppose his mom's words to some extent. That's why he agreed to help Jennifer's daughter. In general, mom was categorically against him communicating with Samantha. She said she was just like her mother. She said that Jennifer had set her eyes on dad, and she wouldn't tolerate it. Hearing this for the first time, George thought that he would give everything in the world if it were possible for Aunt Jennifer to become his mom, not that woman who was his biological mother. And here, deep into the night, George stood together with Samantha among the ruins of Peter's house. They climbed to the second floor. It had suffered little from the fire, just darkened and blackened. It was dark here. But if you let your imagination run wild, you could imagine that they were in an ancient, ruined castle inhabited by ghosts. Samantha persuaded her little friend to go along with this clearly insane idea after overhearing a curious conversation between her mom and some neighbors who came to visit. Previously, Samantha couldn't stand when her mom made her visit Peter because the old man was weird, and there was a bad smell about him. But then, on that evening, Samantha couldn't sleep, and approaching the door, she heard something. She was shocked. 
The neighbor turned out to be insane, he had a bunch of creepy things. Naturally, as soon as she could, Samantha climbed up to see what her mom had brought. She was slightly disappointed because there were no cursed dolls or gold. But there was a picture supposedly with a vampire. Samantha showed her tongue to the portrait, it's not scary at all, just some dark-haired girl, the girl was offended that her mom thought she was just a little kid and didn't tell her anything. Then an idea came to her on how to turn this mystical story into an internet sensation. Samantha had a few subscribers, only a hundred. But she had no doubt that if they released such a video, she would gather a million. But it wasn't very convenient and safe to act alone, so Samantha invited George to join her. Dear followers, I'm glad to welcome you to my page, Samantha said, holding the smartphone in front of her with her outstretched arm. Today, we'll try to summon a vampire, yes, you heard it right. We'll be summoning a bloodsucker. Especially for you, my friend George and I sneaked into the forbidden and cursed house. We'll start now, and you subscribe to me and hit the like button. Concentrating, the girl set up the smartphone on a tripod. Let's go, George, Samantha said cheerfully, sending a smile to her audience, and started helping him. Chalk to draw the circle and symbols, a candle to lure the monster with live fire, salt to drive it away when it appears, sticking out your tongue out of seal. Samantha drew the circle. It turned out uneven. Then the candle didn't want to light up. But eventually, everything was done. Maybe we shouldn't, George? It's getting scary. In general, he knew that vampires didn't exist. And certainly, the evil depicted in the portrait couldn't appear. But the boy couldn't shake off the feeling that they were not alone here. It seemed to him that something, akin to a storm, was approaching, and they risked finding themselves at its very epicenter. Samantha was reading what she considered a vampire summoning spell. George didn't criticize her when she introduced him to this text simply because he had a terrible crush on Samantha, and he was too shy to express his own feelings of fear. However, he felt that her words were nonsense and certainly not a speech capable of summoning an evil spirit, even if it existed. Come, appear, one who thirsts. Oh, darn, the candle went out, and it wasn't surprising. The wind was blowing around. Okay, grumbled Samantha. I've almost finished reading. Now we wait. The kids stood, initially in tense anticipation. Come on, vampire, appear. Then just in expectation. Then Samantha started getting annoyed. She pulled the smartphone towards her and brought her face close to the camera. My dear ones, there are problems with the connection. And generally, the equipment is malfunctioning. These failures are undoubtedly caused by paranormal activity. I have to interrupt the experiment. I'll try to continue and record everything for you. I think I heard something, she stopped recording and turned to George. Okay, I was hoping something would happen on its own. Well, of course, the spell doesn't work. Spells never work, the boy said with all the authority he could muster. Be quiet and listen, silly, Samantha threatened him with her finger, and George thought that he was ready for anything for her attention and wouldn't hesitate to face a real vampire if Samantha smiled at him more often. I'll turn on the recording again, and we'll pretend we hear something and see something. I'll scream, and you grab the camera and pan it from side to side, got it? It will give the effect that something was outside the windows, getting into the house, but we understood in time and escaped. That's what real ghost hunters do. I saw it in England documentary movies. George wanted to ask her what exactly she saw, whether the hunters were running away from evil spirits or an example of how to deceive their subscribers. However, he didn't say a word because he actually heard something. They weren't alone in the house. The boy clearly distinguished footsteps, someone was on the first floor. Samantha, Samantha, there's someone here. Excellent, she nodded. I see a genuine fear, but first. I've got you, I've got you, he babbled, grabbing her by the shoulders, the collar of her jacket. And suddenly Samantha froze, her eyes widened, her face, though difficult to discern anything in the pitch darkness, paled. Someone is pulling me down, she whispered. Someone caught me by the legs. And as if to confirm this, a voice came from below, on the first floor. 
Don't move, everything can collapse. Let go, I'll catch you. But these words were very roughly understood only by George, and Samantha, apparently panicking, suddenly said. A vampire attacked me. A vampire is attacking me. And then she squealed so loudly that George's ears were blocked. Then, apparently, the boards where she fell were quite fragile, because suddenly Samantha fell all the way down and disappeared with a scream below. George didn't understand how he didn't lose consciousness. He acted as if on autopilot. He moved along the wall. Somewhere, he heard that it's safer this way. Carefully, step by little step, he reached the doorway. He heard something happening below, rustling, and then a new scream, a cry. At this point, the boy didn't lose his mind. He moved like a machine. He approached the door and suddenly raised his gaze. The hole where Samantha fell was positioned so that someone standing above the stairs could reach her and, it seemed, pulled her down. But who was it? The boy, illuminating his path with the smartphone, picked it up from the floor and went down the stairs. Samantha was sitting below. Her teeth were chattering, she was trembling, her eyes were round and fixed on one point. Are you okay? George asked, immediately feeling embarrassed. What nonsense. A person cannot be okay, after this. Someone saved you, he spoke again, didn't let you fall. Who was it, and why did he leave? Samantha looked up, then said only three words. The vampire from the portrait. Naturally, the kids had no thought of continuing to film anything. Now that everything was over, they simply walked out of the house in silence and headed home. Or at least, they thought they were going home. But as soon as they stepped over the threshold, they were blinded by car headlights and deafened by shouts. It turned out that Samantha's mom and George's dad had rushed to the house. The adults rushed to the children, examining, shaking them, asking what foolishness they were up to, how they dared to wander around in the middle of the night in such a place. And then it turned out that they became aware of their children's whereabouts not just because they discovered the offspring missing and went to look for them. It was because both of them received a call from an unknown number. The voice sounded strangely distorted but seemed to belong to a woman. And the voice informed them that the kids were in Peter's house. I can't believe it. Jennifer seemed to be about to scold her daughter, but in the next moment, she just hugged her child tightly and burst into tears. Samantha picked up the crying and began swearing to her mother that she would never do anything like that again. Well, boy, you're in trouble, Kevin said to his son. What were you doing here? Samantha wanted to shoot a video for her followers. We were on the second floor and wanted to summon a vampire. What? What second floor, son? The whole place was on fire. You could have fallen. You shouldn't enter the house at all. But Samantha fell, George sniffed. He didn't think that an honest account could attract even more anger from the parents. The floor collapsed there, her legs sank through. But someone was standing below, and, well, he saved her, caught her and lowered her down. What? Jennifer, upon hearing this, instantly lost her mournful mood and began shaking her daughter so hard that her teeth clicked. Oh, you. You could have died. I'll. You won't leave the house until you're 20. You wanted to shoot a video? I'll show you a video. On the last words, Jennifer snatched her daughter's smartphone from George's hands and simply threw it with all her might to the floor, then stomped on it. That's it. Your dolce vita is over, Samantha, get ready. On the way back to the village, Kevin and Jennifer decided not to conduct any educational conversations in the middle of the night. They decided to postpone all the worrying care until the morning. Right now, we'll sneak home like mice. Let's hope mom is sleeping tight, Kevin said. They entered the house quietly, tiptoeing. Go to your room, Jennifer said to Samantha. Dad. Quiet, Kevin tousled his son's hair. You know, the most important thing for me is that you're alive and well. I'm not mad anymore, but we'll have a serious talk. Not a word to your mom. Thanks. George sniffed and went to his room. Kevin hadn't slept in the common bedroom for a long time, he slept on the sofa in the large room. 
Now he peeked into the bedroom. It was quiet in there. Sometimes Brenda snored in her sleep, but now it was so quiet, as if she weren't home at all. Kevin took off his shoes, walked to the sofa, but sleep wouldn't come. Not only because of what his son had done but also because, coincidentally, his strength was running out. Living in such a terribly funny parody of marriage. But what else could be done? They just had to endure. What hurts? Jennifer asked her daughter when they entered the house. Nothing. I told you, I'm not bruised. Mommy, please forgive me. I forgive you, but you will be punished, grumbled Jennifer, spinning her daughter around and feeling her. But it seems nothing is broken, really. You act all grown up, and then you come up with such nonsense. What vampire? From the portrait. He was there, he did come. Yes, of course. Well, that's enough. Go to sleep, we'll deal with this in the morning. And don't wake up your sister. Samantha went to the room she shared with Alana. Jennifer, sighing, went to the kitchen. I doubt I can fall asleep now. I might as well have some coffee to get rid of this headache. What events, as if there weren't enough problems. And that strange call. It turns out someone broke into the burned house this night and accidentally found the children there. And not only found but also saved a girl from falling from such a height. But who could it be? Why didn't he identify himself and why did someone need to get into the house? A shiver ran down Jennifer's spine. Of course, she didn't believe her daughter's nonsense for a minute, but everything was getting eerily complicated. Peter with his madness about vampires, the fire, and now this mysterious and clearly not with good intentions individual. And then Jennifer remembered that her daughter took something from Peter for her adventure, a small portrait and maybe something else. It turns out it remained in the house. It could, of course, be retrieved in the morning, but it was going to rain, and Jennifer was afraid that the antique canvas might suffer from moisture. What if rats became interested and decided to nibble on it? She wasn't sure about the rats, but the approaching storm was a real problem. Jennifer muttered a quiet curse. The painting probably costs a lot of money, and you can't just scatter your wealth like that. So, she, making sure both daughters were finally asleep, grabbed a flashlight and went out of the house. It won't take long, thought Jennifer, and Peter's house is still quite sturdy. She will go in quietly, grab what she needs, and come back. In the night darkness, illuminated by distant flashes of lightning, Peter's house made a genuinely eerie impression. The flashlight beam jerked and jumped. When Jennifer entered it and, carefully checking each step with the toe of her sneaker, started climbing the stairs, a thunderous crash echoed in the now very close sky. She shrugged. What an ugly feeling, as if someone not good was drilling her back with their gaze. Don't be silly, it's just nerves, Jennifer told herself. On the second floor, the floor looked suspicious, but she risked taking a few steps. Moreover, the painting and something else that her foolish daughter took lay very close. Taking the items, Jennifer sighed with relief. Now home and sleep. Everything will be in the morning, everything later. She had already returned to the stairs when lightning flashed. It illuminated the face opposite with a cold, ghostly light. Brenda. The neighbor stood on the stairs, silently looking at Jennifer from below. Oh, why are you here? Did they call you too? Jennifer interpreted her appearance in her own way. Don't worry, everything is good already. My daughter, the fool, started all this. Forgive me, I didn't know, didn't even think about her doing such a thing. Everything is fine. I can imagine how shocked you are. I almost lost my mind. Jennifer kept talking, talking. And it didn't immediately occur to her that Brenda looked strange for a mother worried that her son had run away from home. She stared without blinking. Her face seemed as if carved from marble, with rigid features, jaws tightly clenched. I won't give Kevin away, Brenda said in a colorless voice. What? Whom won't you give away? Jennifer sincerely didn't understand. Brenda, what are you even talking about? What are you doing here? Jennifer was accustomed to living a material life. 
she never relied on things like premonitions or extrasensory abilities. But right now, it hit her like a blow. She felt danger. Brenda, are you okay? Her voice trembled betrayingly when she addressed her neighbor. Brenda suddenly smiled. Jennifer swallowed heavily. In her memory surfaced a documentary about wildlife, where it was said that some predators could sense the fear of their prey and considered its appearance a signal to attack. With Brenda, who somehow ended up here and behaved strangely, Jennifer felt something similar was happening. In this case, she was the victim. You've wanted my Kevin for a long time. He's been wandering to you. Brenda's hands, previously hanging limp by her side, now slowly rose, as if an invisible puppeteer was pulling the strings. I won't give him away. Brenda, what are you doing? The woman blinked in confusion. Kevin and I are just friends. I raise my daughter alone, and I don't need anyone. Brenda, please, let's leave here, and we'll talk calmly about everything. You laid down with the old man first, he gave you the house, now you want to take my husband. Too bad you weren't in the house when it burned. I should have brought you here and thrown you. I regret only burning the house. Brenda mumbled, looking so malicious that what Jennifer heard simply didn't make sense in her mind. She just couldn't believe that Brenda set the house on fire. You stole my mom's man, Brenda said in a strange voice. Now you want to take mine. I won't allow it, scum. I'll destroy you. After shouting these words, Brenda lunged at Jennifer. The latter recoiled, trying to move away, but Brenda grabbed her clothes, pulled, and Jennifer's foot twisted on the stairs. Both women fell, rolling. Finding herself at the bottom, Jennifer was horrified. How noisy it is in my head. Then she realized, it was the storm raging outside, and her head was just splitting from the pain. Her shoulder throbbed. She attempted to get up, but a sharp pain shot through her hip. Screaming, she fell again, and then, with eyes wide open in horror, she watched as Brenda loomed over her. How is this possible? Both fell, but she got up as if nothing happened. The neighbor continued babbling about not letting Kevin be taken away, and she lunged. Jennifer understood. She aimed to grab her throat and wouldn't let go. It was painful, dark, unclear, and heavy. She tried to fend her off, then realized she had lost. Cold fingers tightened around her neck, and in front of her eyes, Brenda suddenly flew backward. Jennifer coughed, blinked, and opened her eyes wide. The neighbor struggled with a tall figure dressed in black. The figure toppled Brenda to the floor, folding her arms back and somehow binding them, rendering her unable to fight further. Then the figure rushed toward Jennifer, and its face came closer. If Jennifer had even a drop of strength left, she would have screamed, because the face belonged to the girl from the portrait. It was the same beautiful 19th century brunette. Lie still, the apparition addressed her, I'll call an ambulance. Where are your fangs? Jennifer asked, because that's all she could think about right now. Vampires are supposed to have fangs. The girl smiled. Her teeth were what you'd call pearly, straight, splendid, but there were no dagger-like fangs. You're so annoying, interfering with everything. Why does everyone come here? The beauty said irritably. Please call Kevin, Jennifer whispered, feeling that her strength was leaving her, and she was ready to collapse somewhere. Did you call us? The brunette looked at Jennifer with a strange mix of disdain and curiosity and nodded. So, you saved my daughter. Thank you, Jennifer exhaled and finally lost consciousness. When Jennifer opened her eyes again, she realized she had been taken to the hospital. Strangely, her body didn't hurt, but the experience in the house had taken a toll on her. Mild concussion, vision will recover, the doctor's voice reached her as if through a layer of cotton. Jennifer groaned softly, shook her head, and finally came to her senses. That's right, she's in the hospital. At the foot of the bed stands a person in a white coat. Obviously, a doctor. Sitting nearby on a chair, holding her hand, creating a pleasant warmth throughout her body, is Kevin. What are you doing here? Jennifer blurted out as soon as she could open her mouth, seeing Alex. We came to visit, didn't we? 
The man awkwardly cleared his throat, out of genuine concern, believe me. Jennifer, everything is fine, Kevin addressed her. The kids are being watched over, Katya is keeping an eye on them. Jennifer nodded. Miss Kate was her longtime friend and, at the same time, her replacement at the store. Brenda, she, was there. Jennifer felt infinitely weak and she desperately wanted to sleep. But at the same time, she understood that she had to say something right now and find out something. She was just afraid to fall asleep while remaining in ignorance. Yes, Brenda, she, Kevin started, she's under supervision now. It was clear that it wasn't easy for him to talk. He looked like a person who had aged several years overnight. It was she who set the house on fire. I know, Jennifer nodded. She thought that we. I should have noticed earlier. You're not to blame, believe me, said the doctor, who to some extent had an idea of what had happened. The symptoms of your wife's illness could easily be mistaken for ordinary character flaws. Brenda went mad, Kevin concluded, the same thing happened to her as with her mother. Jennifer didn't know how to choose the right words to comfort Kevin. She just slightly tightened her grip on his fingers and thought that, no matter how bad he felt right now, he would have to hold on. He had to hold on for the sake of their son. There was, Jennifer now looked at the doctor. She was a little afraid that after her next words, they might consider her crazy. She saved me. I understand that you need to talk to your friends about something important, said the doctor, but not for long. You shouldn't overexert yourself, and I need to go, he finished and left the room. That was my sister, Alex unexpectedly joined the conversation. Her name is Sarah, and her appearance, I swear, was a complete surprise even for me. What? I don't understand. Jennifer fixed her gaze on the capital businessman. She was in shock because she had completely stopped understanding what was happening. But fortunately, Alex had prepared answers. The small group could talk calmly because, apart from Jennifer, there were no other patients in this ward. And Alex started talking. It turned out that in the 90s, Peter, searching for the necessary items for his collection, a theoretical vampire hunter, not only bought them. One day he learned that a certain collector had exactly what he needed. Namely, portraits of the last members of that very family, which, as he believed, kept vampire secrets. The collector told the people who came to inquire about the sale of the paintings that these were priceless treasures, dear to him for personal reasons, and he was not willing to part with them even if he were offered all the gold in the world. Then Peter contacted the bandits. He paid them to steal the paintings. And it was done. The collector was practically killed by grief because he had spent many years of his life searching for these paintings. They were not just some works of art for him. They were directly related to the history of his family because he was a distant descendant of that same lineage. His ancient ancestor, the connecting link, was that same dark-haired beauty from the antique-style portrait. The noble family announced to everyone that the girl had died. Allegedly, she was taken away by illness. But it was a lie. In reality, she had run away, preferring a love match with a poor man to a calculated marriage with a rich man. That's why they decided to erase her from the family's fate, from its history. Peter, of course, did not know that the collector he had struck such a blow was related to those, let's say, vampires he had been searching for so long. Otherwise, this story could have taken a completely different turn. However, this story eventually took its own development. The thing was, the old collector had a son named William. In the 90s, he went to England to build a business there. The son returned when he learned that his father's health had deteriorated. He spent his father's last days with him, holding his hand and listening to his last words about everything being in vain. About the most precious thing being stolen. William was not as passionate about antiques as his father, but he understood that he now simply had to find the paintings. These paintings had to return to his family name, period. He used all his resources but could not find out anything. Moreover, William didn't have much time for this. He had to return to England to avoid losing his business. There, he met a woman named Monica and married her. Two children were born in this marriage, Sarah and Alex. 
When Alex grew up, he decided to return to his homeland and engage in farming. Since childhood, he was drawn to plants. He wanted to work with what grew from the ground. Sarah, on the other hand, decided to follow in her grandfather's footsteps and become a historian. She went to France and then continued her education in England. They communicated a little with their brother, and their views on life were largely dissimilar. Alex, for example, could not understand Sarah's almost desperate desire to find those missing paintings. Yes, he acknowledged that it was a great loss, but it was just part of history, the past. However, his sister did not want to hear about the need to live in the present. She was stubborn, and about a year ago, she shared news with her brother. She had managed to trace the person who had ordered the theft of the paintings. Sarah learned everything about Peter and understood that he would not want to give away the paintings. And he wouldn't want to sell them either. He might even think something was wrong if he saw her face. The point was that Sarah had an amazing resemblance to that same girl who long ago chose love over money and social status. Sarah knew this because she had seen a photograph of one of the missing paintings. Sarah started planning how to infiltrate Peter's house and simply steal the paintings. She believed that paying him back in the same coin would be fair. But then Peter died, and his house burned down. However, Sarah had no intention of abandoning her plans. She already knew that Peter had a secret room and assumed that he might have had a basement or some hiding place under the house where the paintings could have been preserved, unaffected by the fire. Sarah did not want to approach Jennifer. She was afraid that if Jennifer refused for some reason, she would have no opportunity to investigate what was left of the house. After all, Jennifer theoretically could start closely watching that place. That's why one night, Sarah went to the old man's house. And there, children suddenly appeared. She became an unwitting witness to their fooling around with the vampire summoning, and by a fortunate coincidence, she managed to save the little girl. Then she decided to return. And once again, her plans were disrupted. Now Jennifer and Brenda, who had long been watching the one she considered her rival, appeared there. Alex said that he met with his sister after she saved Jennifer. He mentioned being shocked when his sister revealed her failed plans, but he managed to convince her otherwise. He persuaded her that the desire to retrieve the paintings at any cost is abnormal, and it's better to accept their loss. That's the whole truth, said Alex. Now you all know. My sister, she's not a bad person. I met with her and talked. I think I managed to convince her that it's time to leave the past behind before she goes too far. I can promise you that she won't bother you anymore. She's returning to France tomorrow. Jennifer listened to the entire story silently, and now she seemed to have almost no questions left. But she wanted two things badly, to laugh and cry at the same time bunch of idiots, she said and still managed to laugh. She laughed for a long time, then asked Kevin for water because her throat was dry. But I'm glad Peter didn't find out who your grandfather really was, sighed Jennifer when she regained the ability to speak calmly. And I feel sorry for Peter, no matter what. To be so deluded for a lifetime and not have a loved one nearby to help understand that he's losing his mind. Well, okay. The past is indeed the past. As for your sister. Jennifer then explained that a lot of Peter's belongings were still in the house. Alex just widened his eyes when he heard this, but Jennifer didn't let him say anything immediately. She continued, saying that if the paintings were so important to his sister, she could take them for free. Because she has no right to demand money for them or keep them for herself. After all, they essentially came into Peter's possession in this way. You're an amazing woman, said Alex. Well, usually I am, sighed Jennifer. He's telling the truth, added Kevin. I dug up some archives. In a few newspapers from the 90s, they actually wrote about the theft of paintings from a collector. He tried to find them in any way possible, reaching out to literally everyone who could help. When did you manage to do that, frowned Jennifer. You were unconscious for two days, explained Kevin, and she gasped. As for the land, Jennifer said, you know, I won't sell anything. Selling is easy. But Peter wanted me to have all this. So, somehow, I'll be able to do farming on my own. It's not entirely bad, 
I live in the village. There are people who will help, a competent notary. Well, sighed Alex. But what about the land that has already been overgrown with forest? Why do you need it? Jennifer asked in a business-like tone. I thought of starting a flower business. You found time to talk about business, objected Kevin. She needs to rest. You're right. I'll rest, Jennifer yawned, now. I'll take a nap. But let your sister come to me before flying to her France. Is she in a hurry? She has a doctoral defense. Weird. Both a scientist and a thief. Okay, let her come. And can you send the paintings to her later? I'm not sure if that will be possible. They were painted in the 19th century after all. Just don't do anything foolish, Jennifer mustered enough strength to raise her hand and point a finger at Alex. I won't. In general, I live here constantly, and I don't think my sister will mind if the paintings just return to me as the direct heir of my grandfather. I think she'll be happy about it. Finally, Jennifer got a chance to rest. Then her daughters came to visit her. Alana remained serious, Samantha cried and promised to always, always listen to her mommy. And then Sophia came to her. You? Just don't say that I'm an amazing woman, Jennifer waved her hands, I can't bear to hear it anymore. Better tell me, dear, how old are you? 28. I'm 37, sighed Jennifer, sorry if I offend you. But what a fool you are. No, I can still understand the whole situation with Peter. He would definitely have thrown a pitchfork at you, Jennifer chuckled, but you could have come to me. I didn't know if you would agree, if you would allow me to inspect the house, Sophia honestly admitted. I understand that I behaved horribly, wanting to steal. I just couldn't believe that I finally found them, so. The girl shrugged. My brother already scolded me, and you. I don't want to scold you, Jennifer sighed. Just get a grip on yourself in time, girl, or you'll get into trouble one day. Promise? I promise. That's fine. Your brother wants to keep the paintings at his place. I know, Sophia smiled. That will be enough for me. Thank you. You returned our family its history. After that, Jennifer was not bothered. She continued her treatment and rested a lot. But Kevin came every day. And then, on the day Jennifer was supposed to be discharged, he unexpectedly brought her a bouquet of her favorite flowers. I'm getting a divorce, he sighed. Brenda, she's in a mental health facility, and I don't know for how long. I'm very sorry, Jennifer said. Now you'll be alone with your son? I'll manage. No, not alone, she suddenly added. I'll be there if you allow me. That's what I want more than anything in the world.